A big welcome to our guests, our live streamers, and our Zoom callers. Thank you for joining us today. How about this morning, you turn to someone close by and give them a high five and say, God bless you. <laughs> and we want to wish all the women a happy Mother's Day. We are so blessed to have four mothers give their testimonies today. Our vision for PAC is to be a multi-ethnic church that equips and empowers our church family to make more disciples for Jesus Christ as guided by the Holy Spirit. I was very blessed to be a part of the evangelism workshop that was held here this weekend. It was very powerful. And I wanted to thank Alex and Chris and Walter for leading it. And if you would like to hear something very special, ask the Nevezchik children about the three circles. And if you're online and can't ask them, then go ahead and Google the three circles. It's amazing. A quick reminder that our Knit and Need group is meeting this Saturday. All ladies are invited to fellowship and crafting. They are having a mini potluck that day, so if you attend, please bring a small lunchish dish to share. <laughs> the following Saturday, we have a cooking class scheduled, and we will be learning to make Mennonite noodles. And you can register via Connect, or there is a sign-up sheet on the information booth. And there's also some postcards there that you can take and invite your friends. And it's potluck time. Not next Sunday, <laughs> but the Sunday following the 28th. So please sign up to volunteer with the setup and the cleanup. And the paper forms for that are on the wall just by the main entry doors. Also, don't forget to bring some food for you and food to share with others. And when in doubt, bring more. <laughs> following the potluck, we will have a congregational meeting. You can find the agenda and the 2022 financial report on Connect, or there are paper copies on the information booth. There were also some recent changes to the directory. There are some handouts on the information booth to help you keep your directory up to date. If you missed getting a directory or would like to be a part of the directory, please come talk to me about it. It's never too late to send me a selfie so we can get you added. The directory can also be found securely online, and it's always up to date there. In fact, did you know you can update your own profile? We're top notch here. <laughs> Mother's Day can bring a mix of emotions for many people. 
There are those anticipating the birth of their first child, those grieving their inability to have children, stepmoms wondering what their place is, those who have lost their mother and are faced with grieving on Mother's Day, those with painful memories of their mothers. There are moms who encounter feelings of hurt because their children have turned from God and those overwhelmed with pain from the loss of a child. No matter what you face this Mother's Day, you can turn to God and experience peace and healing through prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, on this day, we lift up our women to you. May you bless them and keep them. Give them a deep thirst for your word, and may they lean into you and trust you when they are worried and tired. May your joy be their strength. May they surrender to you each morning and be filled afresh with your Holy Spirit. May they know that your thoughts are not their thoughts and your ways are not their ways, but you can do immeasurably more than they can think or imagine. May they know with their whole heart that you love them just as they are. Nothing they can do can make you love them more and nothing they can do can make you love them less. Each is made in your image and you have a special purpose for each one. May they feel your powerful arms protecting them and lifting them up. May they feel you smiling down on them. May your love flow through them as they care for others. Help them to be full of gratitude and grace and give them wisdom as they guide and instruct. We love you so much, Lord. Bless each mother who is giving their testimony today and may their words reach the hearts of those who hear them and draw them closer to you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. We want to enter into worship this morning and sing about how great our God is. We invite you to stand and sing with us together. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and I will see how great, how great is our God, how great is our God.
praise the Lord. How good to sing praises to our God. How delightful and how fitting. The Lord is rebuilding Jerusalem and bringing the exiles back to Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. He counts the stars and calls them all by name. How great is our God. His power is absolute. His understanding is beyond comprehension. Thank you. 
is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you Good morning. Good morning, church family. Uh, many of you have mentioned it, so I'll just make it clear on the live stream as well. Uh, I am not sick. I am not crying. I don't have pink eye. I simply have allergies. It's about three weeks out of the year here in Manitoba. I have bad allergies. I feel fine, feel great. A little bit of an annoyance. I thought I could get away with it this morning, but enough of you have come up to me and said, are you okay? I'm fine. I'm doing great. Just a little bit of an annoyance. Uh, I, I, I am really excited that the Lord directs services and we don't because we originally had these three mothers that were going to come and share uh, quite a while ago. And from scheduling conflict after scheduling conflict, it all ended up working out that they all three could make it on Mother's Day. 
And I want you to hear this. And you know what? Could I just ask Maria, Phyllis, Sharon, could you please just come on up? Because you're going to be the ones sharing today. And I want to just say these words to you. Um, I'm going to take this off. This is not needed. Uh, I just want to say that there is a similar theme that I noticed in all three of their testimonies. And what I mean by that is all three of you are mothers and all three of you have gone through trials and tribulations and yet the Lord continues to walk with you. I think of Psalm 23 that says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you, the living God goes with me. And I think of that. This is a story and these are going to be stories that are going to share with you how God has worked even in the midst of hardship and difficulty. And I want to thank all three of you for being this vulnerable and being open and honest about your story. Because I know it's wonderful to talk about all the victories, but some of us are in that valley of shadow of death and we need to hear the difficulty and the hardship and how the Lord walks through those difficulties with us. Amen? Amen. So with all of that said, I'm going to hand the mic over to these three uh, wonderful mothers and we're going to have you just share your story with us. Maria, I believe you are first. I thought you'd have more to say first. There we go. <laughs> first blessing of the day. I can't uh, read with my glasses on, so I won't be able to see any of you. Oh. Good morning, church. Happy Mother's Day. My name is Maria Jansen, and along with it being Mother's Day, it also happens to be my wedding anniversary. So it's a special day all around. Before I share my testimony, I want to share a passage uh, I read this morning. It uh, seemed very fitting. The title was, It's Okay to Be Me. Humility sounds so much like humiliation, but it is really the ability to look at myself and honestly accept what I find. I no longer need to be the smartest or the funniest or the strongest or any other ist. Finally, it's okay to be me, and it's easier to be me and accept myself if I share my life. I was born to a single mother under a cloud of fear, shame, guilt, and severe judgment. A perfect recipe to leave scars and conditions that need a lot of healing. I grew up in a home with my mom and her parents. The three of them really did have a desire to know and serve God. Can I get you to hold this for a second? Mm -hmm. We all went to church and prayed, and my grandparents read the Bible constantly. But I leave God had been misrepresented to them as well. I will give you one example. Anytime there was a thunderstorm, even in the middle of the night, we had to get up, sit quietly, our heads bowed in reverence of the Lord because he was reprimanding us, his children, with each loud clap of thunder. It's so sad when someone tells you who God is instead of reading God's word and allowing the Holy Spirit to help you know who God says he is and also who you are in Christ. So even though I had all those challenges to overcome and many very wrong ideas to unlearn, I had a strong desire to know God. In my journey, I searched, and I definitely made many mistakes and wrong turns. I made inner vows like, I will never be like my mother, and I will never marry a Mennonite man. <laughs> because my grandfather and many uncles were very domineering, to say the least. My mother had very little say over herself, or me for that matter. I soon felt that I wanted to feel safe and protected, that I would have to find my own way in life. By age nine, I was worrying about bills and paperwork and budgets. I became very self-reliant and believed that I didn't need anyone. 
I couldn't wait to be independent and move out. So at 13, I got my first job, and in grade 12, even before I graduated high school, I moved out on my own. Those early freedom days felt, oh, those early freedom days left me praying a lot, but only when I was in dire straits, which was a lot. But the rest of the time, I was having fun, working, of course, partying, drinking, generally living a wild life. <clears throat> I was, of course, on the hunt for true love. This also had terrible consequences. Because I had vowed not to marry a Mennonite man, I, I soon caught the eye of a Catholic boy, the oldest of six. He had all the right words, and being naive and unprepared for life in general, I thought I had found <clears throat> the Waltons family. He told me that he loved me after only two weeks and that I was half his heart and God the other half. So we took catechism classes and joined his church. I got baptized and I thought I had finally found, I was finally on the path God had intended for me. So we got married and soon I was expecting our first child. It was then that some secrets came to light, things that made me fear for myself and for my baby girl. So I left, but not before I had sought a lot of counseling. So here I was alone, single with a baby girl at age 26, not so different than my mother after all. But having vowed not to be like her, I worked and worked to provide for her and be independent. I was really spinning my wheels, mostly because I was relying on myself and not God. I had a very hard time trusting anyone, and that included God. God was still looking out for me, of course. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Soon afterwards, I met my husband now, my life partner, a good and kind man, a man that loved God. And lo and behold, a Mennonite man. <laughs> I'd love to say we lived happily ever after, but I still had my own inner healings that, needed, that I needed so desperately to have happen. Even though I had been saved, I had not made God Lord of my life. I had a good husband who loved me unconditionally, and we had two more beautiful children. And the five of us did have a good life, but the busyness of life, children, family, work, church, serving, were all not enough. I continued to ignore God's gentle knocking because I still had a hard time letting go of old traumas and hurts. I was trying to fix things without surrendering. I had such a hard struggle, I thought I couldn't trust God with it all. I wanted to, but I just couldn't. I had let others define who God was, and surrendering my will seemed so scary and impossible. So when it all became too much, I turned to alcohol. I hurt myself, I hurt my poor family, but you cannot outrun God or the calling that he has on your life. I'm glad to say with the help of some of God's angels, I am free of that struggle. I often felt like Jacob, truly wrestling with God, and I sure had more than a sore hip. But I was happy to say, or I am happy to say, that God won. I no longer have to be so self-reliant and fight my battles alone. I know I have the love and the fellowship of many spiritual mothers and sisters, some of them standing right here. Not only have I learned to serve, but I am learning how to truly, how truly freeing it is to trust him. So all the things that the devil tries to use as a weapon to destroy us, God can use for good if only we surrender. Philippians 4, 7. God's peace, which is far beyond human understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in safe union with Jesus Christ. Thank 
website. That was the end, sorry. <laughs> I had a lot more to say. Okay. I'll take my glass. Hold on for a second here. I've been practicing opening this uh, up for the last three days so I wouldn't make a mistake and I still couldn't find it right away. <laughs> Hello, church family. My name is Sharon Burden, and I feel privileged to have born and lived in Winnipeg all my life. As a young child, I remember searching for God. I don't know how I, thought, how I heard about him. I, loved, I followed my friends to their church on Sundays and found Jesus in the pictures we were given to color in Sunday school. I see him standing with his arms open wide, welcoming the little children to come to him. I felt comforted knowing that he cared about little children. Eventually, oh, just a second, Miss here. However, when I was about nine years old, I forgot all about, I forgot all about Jesus and the church. My basic needs were met by my parents for my sister and I. However, somehow I learned that I must be self-sufficient, relying on, relying on myself and trusting no adults. Eventually, I met the man who was to be my husband. He is eight years older than me. I was 18 when we got married. I was pregnant. One year later, our second son was born. We moved into a lovely townhouse managed by Manitoba Housing. My husband drank alcohol on, days, on his days off, which concerned me. I had made a decision never to drink alcohol because there had been alcohol in our home growing up, and I didn't like the way adults acted when drinking. When our boys were one and two years old, I turned to Winnipeg Family Services for parenting counseling, as I felt I did not know how to be a wife or a mother. Um, okay, just a second. Um, <clears throat> Our boys had special needs, and as parents, we argued a lot about how to meet their needs. The counseling continued for both of us <laughs> through the rest of our married life. I got more confident in my skills with their help. During that time, I discovered the wonders of alcohol. I liked the way it made me feel free. In a very short time, I was living a destructive lifestyle. Our daughter was born. I worked part-time in the evenings and weekends. My drinking was out of control when I was earning money. There were many arguments in our home. I was a binge drinker. I would, dr I would try to stop drinking, stay at home, be a good wife and mother. I remembered many happy times enjoying my family. Then I would start drinking and working outside the home, causing much pain and suffering for my family. This went on until I was 30 years old, 10 years from the time I started drinking alcohol. A friend introduced me to Al-Anon, a 12-step program for the recovery of families and al friends of alcoholism. I truly thought all my problems were caused by my husband's drinking. I could not see that alcohol was stealing my sanity and my soul. Within two months taking the steps with the ladies in al and reading the book of Alcoholics Anonymous, I prayed to God to, how, to show me how to manage my life. He revealed to me the stark reality of what I had become. Up to this point, I lived in denial and illusion. I could not differentiate the true from the false. I didn't know that God cared about me. I thought I was not worthy of being saved. I had tried the church many times during that 10 years, but alcoholism and God do not mix. When drinking alcohol, I could not listen to God. I believe that God created Alcoholics Anonymous, my own opinion, so alcoholics could find him. We could not come to him, so he came to us. He broke through my denial and forced me to see what alcohol was doing to me. 
I got a sponsor, a woman who guided me through the steps. Step three states, made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understood him. I now believe I have been given a great gift. I have been an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous for over 40 years. The AA program tells us in order to live a sober life, we must try to carry this message to other sufferers. I say we are God's disciples. It also says that in order to have the strength and over, to overcome the sure trials and tribulations ahead, I must enlarge my spiritual life, learn to rely on God. Through the past years, I have taken Bible studies with different Christian churches, I have accepted Jesus as my savior and was baptized when I was 50 years old. Two passages stand out for me that prove to me how much God loves me as a woman. John 8, 1 to 11, and John 4, 1 to 26. The woman who committed adultery and the law said she should be stoned. Jesus forgave her and told her to go and sin no more. And the Samaritan woman, who normally would not be worthy of Jesus speaking with her, but he engaged in a conversation with her, showing her compassion, acknowledging her sinful life, but offering her eternal life in him. I need to share here that being sober in AA did not keep me from pursuing that same destructive lifestyle. At 10 years of sobriety, I stopped listening to God to find companionship. I did all the things the AA program said not to do, knowing I was wrong. Then God spoke to my heart, and I sought medical help for depression. God whispered to me that he wanted me to seek him first. Then I would never be lonely again. It works. It really does. That's a line from the book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I want Jesus in my life to get to know him better. I know I am unworthy of forgiveness, yet God gave me the gift of sobriety, and now the Portage Avenue Church, to get to know his son, Jesus Christ. I heard Pastor Jedediah say in a sermon a few months ago that Jesus came to save us from ourselves. Yes, that's it. <laughs> I thought to myself, I am the problem, and Jesus is the solution. Today, my adult children and my ex-husband and I are a real family. With God's help, I am sharing my spiritual experience with them, each of them, that they may know the freedom I know today. Thank you for accepting me into your church. Hi. I just want to tell you before I begin that I'm very new in your church. I started here in November of last year and have attended regularly since then. So some of you have seen me and others have not. I moved to Winnipeg on, Ju on June the 18th of last year and um, have been here ever since. <clears throat> My life began in a small village, on a small hospital on Ma Maple Creek, Saskatchewan. I was the first child of five, born to a young farming couple who named Jack and Annie Rothfuss. Although my parents were not believers when they married, I never remember a time that I was not surrounded by the influences of church and Sunday school. One summer while staying with my grandparents, I attended daily vacation Bible school at their church and responded to a story about Jesus and the lost lamb. I understood that I was the lost lamb and Jesus found me that day. In 1952, our lives changed. My parents packed all of our belongings into a three-ton truck and moved our family to a place called Prairie Bible Institute in Three Hills, Alberta. I began my eighth grade there and had the privilege of completing my high school and four years of Bible school in that spiritual environment. 
I met my husband while I was in, at school, and we were married, and together we raised four unique children, two sons and two daughters. In 2009, my husband died, and since then I have been journeying alone with God. Seven weeks ago, my oldest son walked into a critical care center in Winnipeg because he was in severe pain. He is still in the hospital in severe pain, unable to walk. Doctors have done every test. He's still unable to walk. They have done all that they can do, and they still know, don't know how to treat his pain. Because I'm a mother, my heart is filled with fear and anxiety. And I'm asking some of those hard questions. Will he ever be able to walk again? Will he ever have less pain? Will he ever be able to come home? What will his future like, look like? What about his wife and daughters? I have I have lived long enough to understand and have learned that suffering is a part of the life of a follower of Jesus. Philippians 1.19 says, For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. Recently, I have lamented before the Lord, saying, O Lord, come back to us. How long will you delay? Have pity on your servant Rod. During this storm, I have relied on the promises of God's word. Isaiah 59, 55, 9 says, This plan of mine is not what you would work out. Neither are my thoughts your thoughts. My ways are higher than yours, and my thoughts than yours. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. I'm with you, that's all you need. My power shows up best in weak people. Hebrews 13, five, I will never, never fail you nor forsake you. And there are many other promises such as that. I remind myself that God is always there. He is always at work, even though he is silent. Even when I don't feel his presence, he is there. As he has been faithful in the past, so he will be in my present. The truth of my life is this, that God has loved me before I have been loved by my parents, my spouse, my children, and friends. He calls me his beloved. I was formed and knit together in my mother's womb. He has hidden me in the shadow of his wings he has counted every hair of my head and guided my every step. He has been my sur sustainer, my provider, and my comforter. When I come to the end of my days on earth, I will bow before God, and I want to hear him say this to me. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have invested your life into the lives of your family and others. Psalm 95, 6 and 7 say this in closing. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. We are the people he watches over, the flock under his care. This Thank is an you. allergy death trap, so I'm staying away. <laughs> All right. I, I, we have three mothers here. We want you to know that we have flowers for all of you mothers in memory of your mother. Anybody that's been a mother figure in anyone's life, we have flowers for you in the back. And after the service, we do hope you'll grab one. Uh, but we want to say a few words about this, this sharing that you just did. I want to thank you 
that you were willing to be vulnerable, not only share the past hardship, but also the present hardship. But Christ Jesus went with all three of you and continues to strengthen you. And we are so thankful that you were willing to share that. And they wanted to share as a group together. And so uh, we are just so thankful you were able to do this together and support each other. Now, church family, you heard the testimonies today. Uh, they are saying yes to not only Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but yes to this church being their family, their church family. And so you heard their testimony and what I'd ask of you an affirmation of their testimony, I would ask for you to stand as a church. There you go. The family standing with you. Now I would like to say a prayer and church family, what we typically do as a way of affirming, uh, the calling in someone's life. It's a biblical principle. We lay hands on you, but it would be a little too much to get. I don't know how many people are here, but it'd be a little too much to have everybody laying hands on you. So what I would like from the church family, if we could just extend our hands out and I am just going to say a prayer on behalf of the entire church. Okay. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we just want to say thank you, Lord, for Maria, for Phyllis, for Sharon and their boldness and courage to share their story with us. Thank you, Lord, that you gave them, gave each one of them the words to share with us. And I ask, Lord, remind us of those times when we are going through the valley of the shadow of death. Remind us, Lord, and help us to see you walking through those seasons. I pray, Lord, that you would bless them, that, Lord, we would be a blessing to each one of them and encouragement. And I pray that their testimony will have an impact in this church family and beyond. I pray, Lord Jesus, that they would continue to share this story with others of God, your transformation in each one of their lives. I pray, Lord, that even in the midst of the hardship that they are going through, even currently, would they be able to mightily be vulnerable with others so that they would have an opportunity to share of who you are. Lord, help us to be reminded of who you are not just in the good times, but also in the difficulty and in the hard times in life. Thank you for these seasoned mothers that have gone through so much and have still declaring you as Lord and Savior. We love you and we praise you in Christ Jesus' name, the name that is above every name. God's people, can we say? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, mothers. Thank you, thank you, thank you. What is next? Well, we have one more testimony. Yes, we have one more, but we're not welcoming them in. By the way, we are going to have Fellowship Cafe after the service. Please, please go downstairs. Go and talk to Sharon. Talk to Phyllis. Maria, please get to know them more and more. There's a lot more they could share with you and their story. So I hope you'll take that opportunity to do so. Now, we have one more testimony, but she's been around for a little while, and that's Pastor Jennifer. And Pastor Jennifer is a mother, and she's going to come up, and she's going to share a testimony with us. Pastor Jennifer, come on. It's so wonderful to hear all beautiful testimony, and God is definitely making his masterpiece in your life. So blessings. Hello, everyone. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Jennifer Choi, as I was introduced. Uh, my parents were immigrated in Canada from South Korea in 1991. So that makes me 1.5 generation. And uh, yeah, my parents are first generation. My kids were born in Canada. They're second generation. So in between, I'm a 1.5 generation. Um, when Pastor Jedi asked me to share my story as a mother, I felt quite awkward. I would be more comfortable uh, sharing my story as a business person, or as a pastor, or as a woman. Um, but as a mother, I felt so. Um, I felt for my two sons because I was always busy making a living as a single mother. Uh, when my ch uh, first child was uh, three years old and my second son was uh, only six months old, my husband left me suddenly. 
Um, he was my first boyfriend, and we waited for about five years to get married, so I never expected that happen. Uh, I never imagined that my family would break apart so easily without any warning. As a single mother and with fatherless children, we carried on with our lives. I'm truly thankful to my parents because they took care of my children and raised them while I worked outside the home. I spent a lot of time away from my children due to work, but I tried to bring them along whenever we went to church or on a mission trip. Uh, when my boys were little, I often came home late and found them sleeping in their beds. I would lay my hands on them and pray for them. Of course, they don't know. <laughs> because I couldn't be a mother who stayed at home with them and spent a lot of time with them. My prayers always ask God to be their parent. A couple of years ago, as my first son entered puberty, my menopause slowly started to. So one day we had a huge argument and I felt that my prayer had become a reality. My son was my son, but he was God's child. And that is the most important and essential fact that both he and I needed to recognize. So I can confess that day, Lord, he is your child. <laughs> By the way, all the teenagers, your mother's menopause is crazier than your puberty craziness. So don't even think about trying to win an argument with your mom, okay? When I say that, um, this, it's not easy to, I, I said it's not easy to raising a teenage, uh, teenager. A wise grandmother once told me with a gentle smile, Oh, just wait until they become grown-up children. They are no longer under your authority, and they teach you how to pray harder. <laughs> oh, Lord, they are definitely yours. <laughs> but that doesn't mean I will abandon my responsibility as a mother. Um, as a Mother's Day approaches, I've been reflecting on what it means to be a godly mother. I think um, being a godly mother means to recognize the lordship of our Lord Jesus Christ in our children's lives. Many times our, uh, our journey as a mother will face um, circumstances where we feel powerless to control or change our children's lives. Think about Moses' mother. He did, she did everything she could to protect her little boy, Moses. For three months, she was able to keep him hidden, but eventually, she had to let him go. Can you imagine the heartbreaks she experienced when she realized she could no longer care for or control her uh, baby's life? As she prepared a basket, placed him among the reeds along the bank of the Nile, there was only one thing she could do pray. She prayed to God with tears and shattered heart, entrusting her baby to God's protection and care. Fellow mothers, when your child makes decisions that you cannot change, or when they go in a direction you've asked them to avoid, please remember to pray. Our faithful God is their Heavenly Father, the one who created them and loved them, loves them more deeply than we can comprehend. His love is everlasting and unwavering. Don't lose hope and never give up. Instead, pray for your child. Sometimes each day uh, we feel heavy and difficult. It may seem like we are wandering through a desert without a water bottle, or without a well. We all experience the rising cost of living, and you may not have enough savings or even lose your job. You may not know how to face tomorrow to see any hope. Now, we meet a mother in 1 King James chapter 17 who faced a similar struggle. 
Elijah encountered a widow as he entered the town gate. She was gathering sticks, and he asked her, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? And please bring me a piece of bread. The widow replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my boy that we may eat it and die. This single mother facing extreme hardship had lost hope because her reality was harsh. She had a nothing but a handful of flour and a little oil. That was it. During that time, there was a drought and perhaps everyone was suffering. But this poor widow and her son were among the most severely affected. And then there is this man whom she had never seen before, asking her to give up her last bit of bread. The final meal for this poor mother and her son. However, even Eliza told, uh, when Elijah told her, don't be afraid. If you make this bread and give it to me, the Lord says the jar of the floor will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day of the Lord gives the rain on the land. She didn't respond with skepticism or disbelief. She didn't say, are you crazy? Get away from me. How can you demand such a thing? I would say that, but she didn't. Instead, she did as Elijah had instructed her. She chose to trust God's word over her desperate reality. She placed her faith in God, making her own needs and plans secondary. Her situation remaining unchanged, but she followed God's guidance because her priority was not her own well-being or desires. It was obedience to God even in the face of hopelessness. This widow is a remarkably, re remarkable example of a godly mother found in the Bible. A godly mother's priority is God, even when facing death. Regardless of the hardship you may be enduring, please make God your foremost priority in your life. Another amazing aspect of this story is that it was God who sent Elijah to her. God informed Elijah that he had commanded this widow in that place to provide him with food. God didn't send Elijah to a wealthy widow, but to the poorest, poorest one, a woman who had, he, she was preparing to die with her son because she had nothing left. I believe that God knew her faithfulness and trust in him. And he was confident in sending Elijah to her. This widow, without even a name, some of whom no one cared for, perhaps the most destitute person in that town, was known to God. This is the godly mother in whom God had such a confidence to send Elijah. Being a mother is not easy. You know you're, you're a mother when you're up each night until 10 p.m., Vacuuming, dusting, wiping, washing, drying, loading, unloading, shopping, cooking, driving, flushing, ironing, sweeping, picking up, changing seats, changing diapers, bathing, helping with homework, pay, pay, paying bills, budgeting, clipping coupons, folding clothes, putting to bed, dragging out of bed, brushing, chasing, block clean, feeding them, not you. Plus, swinging, playing baseball, bas uh, bike riding, pushing trucks, culling dolls, ro roller braiding, basketball, football, catching bubbles, a sprinkler, slide nature walk, coloring, crafting, jumping rope. Plus, ranking, trimming, planting, edging, moving, gardening, painting, and walking the dog. You get up at 5.30 a.m. and you have no time to eat, sleep, drinking, or go to the bathroom. And yet, you still manage to gain 10 pounds. <laughs> Mothers, you're amazing! 
Uh, let us strive to be a good, mo- a godly mother who trusts in God and pray in all circumstances. Even if your children seem lost in this world, keep praying and never give up. Remember that God loves your child even more than you do. Furthermore, let us be godly mother who prioritize God even in the midst of hopeless situations. Your own needs and wants and even your child's, may become secondary. Show your children that God is always first and foremost by obeying Him, even in the most challenging challenging circumstances. Happy Mother's Day, and let us look forward to celebrating Father's Day in June. (laughs) So praise and worship team, please come up. And all the children, you can go to your class. Remember, your mom loves you. Church loves you and Jesus loves you. As Jennifer has said, God provides for us in our deepest troubles and, um, and we want to sing this morning a song uh, about that. It's called Day by Day. Uh, we invite you to stand as we sing and as we continue to worship together. passing moment strength I find to meet my trials here trusting in my father's wise instruction I've no cause for worry or for fear he whose heart is kind beyond all measure gives unto each day
Today, as we celebrate Mother's Day, I'd like to emphasize that mothers are not solely defined by their biolog biological connection to children. I personally have a spiritual mother who uh, always uh, pray for me and encourage me, and she never get married in his, her life. And my friend, a uh, very devoted Christian, um, because of her health issues, she cannot get pregnant, but she is uh, serving uh, children's ministry. Uh, as like as a mother so we have uh, lots of spiritual mothers in your life and we give a praise for that so it is important to recognize and include all mother figures in our lives and honoring their love and sacrifice and expressing our gratitude gratitude on this special day but I think it's important to recognize also that there are mothers who do not fulfill their responsibility as well um, during my time working as a social worker in a child protection team, I encountered numerous instances of neglect, neglectful or abusive mothers. Um, if you happen to have that experience in such a situation, I invite you to join me on a journey of forgiveness. Um, my chaplain friend, uh, once told me that if you do not transform your pain, you transmit it. So where do we begin? The process of forgiveness begins by seeking forgiveness from God through Jesus Christ, who can then guide us in forgiving others. Embracing forgiveness brings about a sense of liberation and freedom in our lives. 
If you'd like to learn more about Jesus Christ and how he can set us free, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can contact us by phone. You can contact us by email. Uh, you can contact me or Pastor Jedediah or any of uh, Portage Avenue Church family. We are, we are so happy to meet you and we'll, we'll share our experience as you heard today. So let us all rise for the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And all God's children say, amen. The grace of the Lord will be with you and we'll see you next week.